Yes, people, how are we doing? Welcome to another episode of the Pete Podcast. Today, we are joined by Liam Conroy, former English professional boxer, uh, won the English title, challenged for the British title, and had a great story career in the sport of boxing. In the episode, we touch on everything from early boxing life, how he got started, performance, mindset, and his biggest influences. So stay tuned. If you like the episode, like, share, and subscribe. Brought to you by Coast Road Studios and in association with Powered by Peak. Right, nice one, mate. Cheers for coming on. Um, been a while since we've been in this room, obviously sitting down having a crack. The first one was, I think we Banging Heads 1, wasn't it? That yeah, you come yeah. on. But uh, obviously now that Peak's been going, uh, me and Luca are obviously trying to launch the channel and uh, get people on from the local area that we want to have a crack with, delve into their career, what drives them, um, their traits, discipline, mindset, so... Obviously, good place to start with you, exactly. Obviously, you had a mad career. You had a crazy life in the sport of boxing. First of all, mate, if we can get started, how did you get started in boxing? Like, what started the whole journey off? Yeah, so I think my mum took me for, like, a bit of confidence. I always liked the thought of doing, like, a fighting sport when I was a kid. I did a bit of karate and stuff when I was very young. But it was my mum that took me first. I always had a punch bag in my house. Because of my dad being into boxing and stuff, he used to like pad me and whatnot. Mm. But then, yeah, it was my mum took me for like a bit of confidence, really. I was like, well, shy. She took me to Pat Ryan's when I was like nine. Nine years old, yeah? Yeah. And just like used to mess around doing that because I used to play like loads of sports. I used to like go straight from rugby, be covered in mud, like using wet wipes to clean my legs in the car and stuff, straight to boxing. Uh, and then I never really loved it then. I just liked the thought of doing it. Was it just more of something to fill the time as well an extra sport to do when you were a kid yeah and then it wasn't until I was like a teenager when I went to Farncliffe a couple of my mates were going to Brook Street and then by then by the time you're a teenager you, you fancy yourself as a bit more of a fighter <laughs> yeah you think you're yeah. tasty <laughs> yeah and then uh, I went down that's when I went down Brook Street and that started getting proper into it then but down there we were sparring more and stuff so was so it more like it. was that more like a at the time, was it more like a, a serious setup for the amateur side, side of it? Like this, more, more, lot more sparring, a lot more lads there. Yeah, a bit Brooks, busier. Yeah, Brooks Street. I think I don't think they really had the belief in me as a fighter when I was at Pat. Really, I was a bit of a chubby little kid, yeah, and pretty shy and stuff. I was one of the younger ones. And then I went to Brook Street, and it was like a clean, clean slate. And a few of my mates went, and. Uh, Obviously, I'd done boxing for a few years on and off anyways. Yeah. And I got down there and I've de- de- seen a bit of promise in me then, I think. And then, obviously, you start sparring as you get older and stuff. And I, I was starting to, like, rough people up a bit and stuff. So so, uh, so at that age, obviously, you're mad impressionable from what, what would you have been, about 11, 12? Yeah. When you went to Brook Street? Yeah. What sort of, because I know I played sports when I was a kid, but I was never really, I was always drawn away from it. And obviously, I know you from growing up. You were never really that kid that was like out partying or doing nah. shit. You were sort of dedicated from an early age. Where did that come from? Like, what what made you stay in the gym as a kid when there's so many distractions? I don't know because there were plenty of distractions. Like my mates were, like you know, like my group of friends, and they were just like any other group of lads. But I'd always make sure I'd be in the gym and then go and meet them when yeah, I went yeah, out afterwards. and stuff. And I was like, I was happy. I was always happy not to drink and stuff yeah. and just like fitting anyway. So I guess. I guess that come from the confidence from boxing. Yeah, yeah, they give you. yeah, I guess it gave me the confidence then to be able to like be around people drinking and, and being be around to it. sober and yeah, 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 and stuff like that. And then <clears throat> I remember for for whatever reason, my mum and dad were just like well supportive of me. So I think that was like a big help. Like I remember my dad saying to me. Like, if you don't train every day, you won't be a professional boxer. I remember him saying that to me, and it was probably like a just like a little passing comment to him, but yeah. it's something that stood out to me. And you remembered it? Yeah, and the same with my mum. I remember when I was around 14, so I'd been having amateur boxing matches then, and I remember saying to her, my mates were going out, and I was like, I'm going to go and see my mates. I'm stacking boxing tonight. And she was like, she was like, it's not a choice. It's just you just do it. It's just like going to school or yeah, work. Yeah. You it's just, part of you, you now, isn't it? It's like, you just train. You just yeah. do it and then do whatever you want after it. And that's another one that stuck in my head. And I look back and I thought, it's probably had quite a big impact, impact on me at the time without knowing. Yeah, because obviously it's easy, to, especially when you're a kid, you want to be, 
you have all these goals, you might want to be a world champion boxer, you might want to be a pro boxer, you might be able to be a pro footballer. Yeah. But to have the stones and mindset to actually stick in yeah. and commit to it as a kid, because you probably know loads of people around here that, not just here, every, anywhere in the country that have probably had talent, but been sidetracked, been drinking, smoking. Yeah. Especially when all your mates are probably doing them things like all my mates were, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, there's so many distractions to pull you away from it, but the fact that you're stuck in. Was it the... Could you see a career then from it? Yeah, I remember when I was like a young teenager, I kind of, I don't know why I had the idea that I'd be a professional boxer, but I did. Um, I remember saying it to my teacher in school and I think in, in school, in my lessons, I kind of carried like an arrogance that yeah, I was yeah. like, oh, how this goes, I'm going to be a professional boxer. I don't even think I thought I was going to be make loads of money or anything. Yes, that was going to be your job. I just, I just didn't care. I just wanted to like fight for money. That was just, <laughs> like, cool as fuck though. That, right? Yeah, <laughs> that, that's what I proper thought was dead cool. Like, oh, you get to fight for money. So that is buzzing. I remember thinking like, yeah, I'll do a bit of bare knuckle boxing. I'll do a bit of that. <laughs> and just like to make money. I remember man being into that until I got in the yard. And it started to sway me the other way and started getting comfortable thinking I actually don't need to fight for money. I've got yeah, a, yeah. I've got a job here that's just like I can do whatever I want and get paid well kind of thing. But still boxing on the side as well. Yeah, and I was like <clears throat> just buzzing off being an amateur boxer, turning up to shows every week and and um Was that what made you fall obviously you went professional later, but just the the fighting regularly, not knowing who you're fighting, the yeah. amateur shows, no tickets. Yeah. Is that what you loved, like just fighting every weekend? Yeah. If yeah. you could. Yeah, I was I got like I was kind of well known in amateur boxing circuit around here just because I was used to take my stuff to random shows and just weigh in and be like, if anyone's <laughs> weird and they've not got someone like I'll fight kind of thing. So I, I had like quite a lot of fights in a short space of time. Um and that's yeah, that's just what I liked. And going back to like growing up with my mates as well, my mates actually, even though they might have been like drinking and stuff, like they were actually well supportive as me to be fair. No one ever really tried to push me to do it. Cause yeah, I, it was like oh, they, they sort of protected you and knew that you were doing your thing. Yeah, a lot of my friends kind of, I guess they thought that I might do something in boxing as yeah. well. So like whenever, whenever people were taking whatever yeah, doing yeah, whatever yeah. they'd be like oh, no nah, conroy won't no nah, yeah, yeah don't even offer him it and stuff like that so it's a good I, good one for him to be like that though isn't yeah, it? Support, even like so i owed i owed them a thanks for that really because yeah. obviously at this stage of life now i can look back and be like yeah so when when was the turning point for you so you, you competed as an amateur you what was the sort of level you got to as an amateur because you did you did a lot of the big competitions obviously the abas yeah so I think when I was about 17, you could start fighting adults at the time. I think the rules have since changed. I think they have like a youth bracket now, but yes, at the time yeah. it was like, you, I could fight like 20 odd, 30 year old blokes. Crazy that. Um, and I'd, and I was like, I knocked a couple out and like done a couple yeah, of body yeah. shots and stuff. I won a Northwest title. I was like the youngest person to do it at the yeah, time. Um, I got Charles for England and stuff. I'd been in bit of, I'd been in a bit of trouble and stuff and I got I got Charles for England and that kinda like made me think like, like you know, bit, yeah. dedicate it to it. Yeah. Um and then how it come about for me to turn professional was basically they, they brought out a rule where you could have five professional fights and come back as an amateur. What that's mental. Yeah, so I didn't fancy it because, like I say, I'd got in. I'd got. I was in the yard. I think I was just like coming out my time. You know, I felt like I had loads of money, yeah. and I was like going on a few nights out with mates and stuff. I was like, I just like being able to fight every weekend, go out on a Saturday after it or whatever, yeah. and just like just happy doing that. But my mum was poorly with cancer, and I got Alvin and Jeff <laughs> from Bro Barra Boxing Club kind of like said to me, "Why don't you do it?" And they were like yeah, kind yeah. of pushing me towards it. And I never really fancied it, but like a massive driving factor was to make my mum like proud oh, kind of thing because yeah, yeah. she was poorly. Yeah, yeah. So like the the last couple of amateur fights, said like my mum was coming. She had like nowhere from chemo, really? and actually she was like turning up to watch oh. me at Grange and stuff, like boxing on the amateur show there yeah. and stuff. And I just remember that being like a massive thing. I was like, I'll have five pro fights and just make her like well proud. And just see how it goes. Yeah, I did. And the then go back as an amateur. Was that the plan? Yeah, that was the plan. I did day beers one more time because I really wanted to box for England. Like I said, I yeah. had England trials and stuff, but not got on it. I did the ABAs one more time. I was like, I'm going to try and box for England. I'll win these and box for England. And then I lost in the Northwest finals, but I lost to a kid that had been boxing for 
England that week. Ah, right, okay. And then the ABAs. Yeah. I'd, I'd actually levered him before, um, the year before. Like, um, well, when I say levered him, I'd, I'd give him a count <coughs> and stuff and, like, beat, yeah, him, yeah. beat him well. And then this time, he'd, he'd just run rings around me and box me head off. I couldn't get near him. He was, like, really tall, rangy boxer. And then um, I went to his corner to shake, shake the coach's hand at the end of the fight. And the coach was like, you'd make a good pro, you. And I was like, oh, Jeff and Alvin have been mentioning this to me. Yeah, yeah. And then there, from there, I was just like, yeah, I'm just going to make my mum proud and do it. I'll have five. She'll buzz off it because no one really, not many people from Barrow had done it at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. It was, was pretty was, unheard was of. None, was it? Oh, it was Lee Keller. And yeah, I think Lee was the first one and then it was me. Crazy. So yeah, no one had really done it. And then as soon as I did a couple of pro fights, I was like, oh, this is actually better. Like the yeah, actual yeah. fighting, I enjoyed like the fighting in the pros better. Because it is a totally different style, isn't it? It's yeah. A, is that why the guy said you'd be a really good pro? Is the amateur, obviously I'm quite new to it, so I'm sort of still understanding it, but obviously the the styles are very different, the point scoring and everything. Yeah, it, so. and at the time, then it was even more so because I like the computer scoring, they had, they had oh, okay. head guards for seniors and stuff. And I hated wearing a head guard. I just wanted yeah. to... I I just liked a bit of a fight. Like yeah. I like I like to hold my feet and stand with people, and I thought of myself as a bit of a like little slugger like that. So, <laughs> yeah. so like that was kind of what was like renowned for at the time as the difference between yeah. a pro and an amateur. Like the amateurs would be like a bit more like that fencing style. Yeah, in our point and, scoring. Yeah, and I was wanting the people to st- hold, hold the feet, feet with me really. Yeah, and getting into a scrap. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that was like kind of what tempted me to turn pro. Then when I turned pro, I actually started thinking I could, I need to improve my feet, and actually started started do move my feet and like you would like, try and be more yeah, clever yeah. about it. So maybe if I knew what I knew, then I yeah. might have done better as an amateur. So yeah. when how old were you when you turned pro? Nineteen. And then where did it go from there? So I had my first couple of pro fights stayed at Barrow Boxing Club at Brook Street. And then I was training, I was sparring a lot at Johnny Roy's in Preston. Yep. With a lad called Matty Clarkson. And then I, I basically made the decision to relocate my f- training to be there full, full time. time. And yeah. that's, where, that's where I stayed for the next 10 years. And then obviously you had a storied career from then on. Yeah. Uh, what? How did you find the travelling to Preston? I know it was probably, it was just part of it, you just did it. Yeah. But... Obviously, we are at a geographical disadvantage here, aren't we? And it's sort of like, it is a bit shit for people. Obviously, I can't imagine the travelling was easy doing that, what, three, four times a week? I did it five times five a times week for a week. ten years, yeah. Christ, mate, I you think, to put some miles in. I think, like, yeah, when someone added up how much petrol money I'd spent, <laughs> once, sick of me, I think, as well, when I was, like, around that 17, 18, 19, I, I remember people talking about being advan- being a disadvantage living here yeah. to, like, not succeed and things and yeah. that. I think that was, like, a bit of a driving factor so for you, me as well. To you think could show like, them that you... Yeah, and I used to think, like, later through my career, I used to be, like, I want to show, like, young kids that... I'm not saying it. It's you, just not, like, a yeah. full stop. You're from Barry, you have to stop when you're a senior. Yeah, because probably people use further. it as an excuse, don't they? Yeah. Sort of, do you know what I mean? Yeah, they definitely do with anything and I'm like if you really want something you just chase it don't yeah. you it, I suppose doing it it had its advantages for you obviously when you progress your career and you were working yeah. you weren't relying on that to make money yeah. do you know what I mean so you could probably view it differently yeah, yeah. but obviously if you were, weren't working you could have probably trained more three times a day yeah, but then yeah. how would that affect you? it's all relative you don't know how it would have affected you how nah, yeah. do you know what I mean but again it, I know obviously pro boxers early on scraping around for tickets because that's the wages. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, maybe you might have viewed it differently. You might have not fell in love with it as much as you did. You might not have carried on doing it as long as you did. Yeah, yeah. Or you might have you might have been better for you not working. But again, it's all relative, isn't it? Yeah, I think quite sometimes. I remember there being a time when I was like seriously considering moving to Preston. And probably the only thing that stopped me would be my missus because yeah. I've had the same missus since I was a kid. And she's like um, really close to her family and stuff. And that was probably like the only thing that stopped me. And you were going to take the leap and just do it full time? Yeah, because I would have probably happily been absolutely skinned to box at the time. Yeah, yeah. With the I'm, mind frame you were in. Yeah, but I I have no regrets now. I'm glad it's gone how it went. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I remember that being a thing. Like, because I remember my, tr- my trainer actually, I think it was my trainer. Someone said to me, if you have a safety net, you'll fall. If you have that there. Yeah, yeah. 
you'll always know you can go back to it. Like when I lost, I knew I was going back to the yard on Monday. But it's a cliche saying, isn't it? It's like they always say people that have got fuck all, I've got fuck all to fall back on. Yeah. They work 10 times harder. Yeah, yeah. Probably not, that's not true for you because you nah. still work just as hard, if not harder because you were working full time anyway. Yeah, I can't picture really putting anything more into it and than you already I did. did. So that's probably why I've happily left it. Cause yeah. I know there's like a lot of people when they retire, they keep coming back or they try and stay involved sometimes or they, they have some type of like regrets I have none because I know I, I don't think I could have done anything more. To be fair as well, like that safety net, if that's what you want to call it, has been your retirement because most yeah. boxers, what they got to do when they finish boxing, yeah, coaching, yeah. be around the pot, I don't understand, well, probably some it pays really well, but for the vast majority, I bet the, they don't have it as well as you've probably got it now, do you know what I mean? Yeah, a good yeah. career that you knew that was there so you could retire when you wanted yeah, and not yeah. fight too late, get brain damage or whatever, because it happens, doesn't it? Yeah, Because they're fighting to make money. So it's probably worked out better for you in yeah, that sense. Yeah, definitely. Like, well, what did you say? It's like a dead small percentage of boxers like make enough money to see them it's crazy, for isn't the it? rest of their life. Like, and, but probably a massive, a massive percentage probably come out with some type of like CT. physical impediment or something like it's right though it's a brutal sport isn't it it's yeah, like yeah. It's just literally throwing bricks at each other but again like them safety nets what you want to call them they can work for and against you I suppose yeah, don't yeah. They? but obviously it clearly well worked for you do you think obviously the way that you did it um, obviously we'll get on to what you achieved in a minute but the sort of lessons it's taught you going forward now does it feel like you probably achieved a hell of a lot when people thought you probably couldn't be in from here yeah, does, that, yeah. does that give you a bit of a spurt to do whatever the fuck you want now because yeah. people probably have written you off saying is he going to get to the level you got to because yeah. you're here because you're working do you know what I mean yeah no like, all, all through my career every fight I had I was like a bit of an underdog like yeah. the higher profile it got um, but yeah like I took a lot of lessons in my life from boxing and I think it's kind of like shaped me to be the person I am because like I've took a lot of stuff from boxing that I'll like pass down to my kids exactly, about like yeah. working hard for things and not not being told no if you want something like yeah. I think we can get good at things like I don't really I know there's like there's natural talent and natural ability but I think you can make up for a lot of it with just grafting like just grafting out putting the hours in yeah. putting reps in yeah yeah and I think it's like I always tell my little lad who's five we always say it's a secret we know the secret because if we just keep turning up to training we'll get good at it and we'll overtake everyone yeah. that started off better than you and stuff. I always say it's a secret, we understand it. Some people don't. I uh, I heard a good quote from a guy once, it was, I think it was Carl Prince in Top Team, shout out Carl, but he was like, it's not about who's best, it's about who's left. Yeah, at the yeah. end of it, like the guys that just keep showing up might not be the best on the map the first time they can rock on, but it's like, they just keep showing up with work hard and everyone, if they can withstand how hard it is, draining it is, and you can cut it, yeah, you're going to yeah. be good, do you know what I mean? Because everyone else just falls by the wayside because yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to do, isn't it? Like, there were people from round here that were better than me when I was a teenager that just stopped when they got to 17 and stuff and yeah. wanted to go out and stuff. But I like, bet they all regret it now. Yeah. And I think, like, yeah, they'll look at me and think, ah, oh, you still have room or whatever. <laughs> Well, yeah. I, I know my brothers boxed though, like as schoolboys, and they got they won like the Northwest Championships as schoolboys. Yeah. Got to 14, 15, 16, just pissed it all up the wall, drank. Won't mind me saying it. They're yeah. always on about the wish you'd have done it, and it's like I wish you'd have done it as well. But yeah. they were at an all right level, like when they were kids, they could have gone on to box at a high, high level as an amateur. But again, just get sidetracked, don't they? And like yeah. obviously, a couple of your mates really good boxers, weren't they? Yeah. Um, but. Again, it's just how dedicated you were to keep going. Yeah, and same like turning pro, like the the gym I was in at Preston, we used to spar like three times a week. I'd like turn up to work with perforated eardrums, like <laughs> nose swollen to death, and I was like working in the offices. And like I remember turning around to my do my boss, and my boss was like, "Don't know how you do that kind of thing." Like, <laughs> yeah, like, to keep doing I it. I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't hear him, so I was having to turn because I had a perforated eardrum. My nose was massive, and I was just like, probably like, it's just like because I stuck at it. Like a lot of people would just be like, "Suck that!" I'll just, yeah, I'll just. But because I stuck with it, I managed to do all right. But yeah, it's but just I feel like sticking with it, like you say, when you persevere, there's probably a few times that you're probably thinking, should I carry on? But you achieved a lot, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I nearly retired about three times during my career. Just would add enough of it, won't go yeah, the way you I thought. Didn't, it just, you just get getting to a point where I think, right, I've got to as far as I can get. Yeah, I got to as you far thought as you'd reach your ceiling. Yeah, and I was like, right, I can just go back in the yard now. 
I've got that there. Because you of sort of that goal you set of being a pro, you'd done it. Yeah. So yeah. is it sort of like, well, I've, I've said I'd wanted to be a pro, I've done, I'm a pro now, I've had fights, I've won good fights. Yeah, yeah. And you should sort of go off into the sunset. But yeah, like the one I've spoke about loads of times, is like I got stopped on prize fight when I was like 22 on TV. That, yeah. Like, didn't think it at the time, but looking back, I was like quite young in my head, like fighting on telly and like, I think the occasion got to me a bit and I, and I got stopped and then I was going to, I was going to retire then. And it was only because I'd spoke to Johnny and he was like, you're not finished. Like, you, yeah. there's loads more coming for you. Just, this won't define your career kind of thing. We were just talking about that before we come on, where we started recording that boxing, people get written off after a loss and it's, yeah, it's stupid. Yeah. And you, li- you might listen to what other people saying, oh, he's done, he shouldn't have done it. It's like, you're young, you are, what, you're 22? Yeah, yeah. Just getting started. Yeah, at the time, I was like, that's as far as I can go. And then when I won the English title, the guy that beat me was like on the undercard of me fighting for an area title kind of thing. It was just mad how it Yeah, that's crazy, isn't it? Like that. Because I, I remember watching that English title when you won. Was it Joe McIntyre? Yeah. And you... um underdog again going into that you beat yeah. him and he's, was it in his own in his own town yeah yeah some fight that you absolutely <laughs> fucking folded him didn't yeah, you yeah I don't think <laughs> I've ever punched anything as hard in my life like, <laughs> it was quality right. was it the second round did you yeah. drop him in the first yeah, right yeah. you're thinking yeah 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 I've got a good memory any. me <laughs> yeah, yeah it's a good memory <laughs> but uh, yeah I remember watching that fight and thinking fucking hell like pro title any pro title is big but to win an English title it's fucking massive isn't it especially coming out of a little sleepy yeah, town like yeah. Barrow and then obviously you got big opportunities from there, like the Boatsy fight, yeah. which was crazy. Do you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? Look at look at where he's at now. Do you all, know what I mean? All come off the back of that, really. Like I was a voluntary defence, not a mandatory or anything. Like I'd won, I'd won like an area title and stuff. But my Johnny <laughs> seek that fight out, and they they were kind of like, yeah, we'll take that as an as an easy voluntary yeah, kind yeah. of thing. <laughs> And we kind of like kidded on that we were just there to like yeah, make yeah. up the numbers kind of thing, but uh, yeah, it was quite easy to catch and that. So yeah. I don't like I said I don't think I've ever punched anything as hard as my life since. What's happened? Is he still fighting? He carried on fighting. He? he he retired a couple of fights after that, and then he came back and he had a couple of fights like last year against like Lyndon Arthur. Oh, okay, and, he fight him, yeah. Yeah, but I, I don't think he's done so well. I think he he re won. English title. Did he? That's he good was, then, isn't it? He was trying to go for the British, but I think after you've had a few years out, yeah, yeah, and every other new blood's coming yeah, through. Yeah, yeah, you got like, and if if you've had a couple of years thinking like boxing's not to be all and end all to me, and then you're gonna fight some kid that's like it's hard to come back in it. He's, he's on the up and he's chomping at the bit, and all they care about is boxing. It's just like, yeah, good luck. Yeah, you. there's a big difference, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. So obviously going from there was I might get my timeline messed up here, but did you fight Stephen Ward after Boatsy or before? After, yeah. After, I still think you should have won that fight. By the way, yeah. like, I remember watching it. It was a fucking crazy fight. You should have had that. Was it the European? Yeah, yeah. You should have had that. It was bollocks. Uh, was it a headbutt? And he said, I said it was a punch. He said it was a headbutt. Yeah. He said it was a headbutt and it was a punch. It was a clean punch. Well, well, or from what I remember, I might be wrong, but yeah, yeah. We we couldn't find the headbutt headbutt on the on the clip, but it was a bad cut. So there you go then, you couldn't yeah. find the head, but yeah. but yeah, what a fucking fight that was, wasn't it? It was crazy. That was yeah. a belting fight. Did we ever talk of running that back? Was I, am I right in thinking that was meant to happen? Um, or was there talk of it? We we both entered the golden contract Ah, that was it, okay, it yeah, yeah. could have drawn each other, but we were kind of like, me and Steve Ward were like sparring partners and stuff. Oh, really? So, yeah, so he was my sparring partner for the Boatsy fight, like my main sparring partner. The yard gave me like loads of time off work, yeah, so yeah. he used to spend the days going to Manchester to spar him and stuff so it was kind of like a pal and then when the, I was gonna like again like when I lost to Boatsy I was like that's me go to the British title kind of thing I don't know yeah. whether I'm just gonna sack it or not yeah, yeah. and then I got off that fight and I was like it's for a European title and I remember thinking I don't know whether to take it because I kind of not like a mate but I was like yeah it, it was feels well a bit snide to, yeah, yeah, taking to it. accept it and well, he was he the title holder at the time? It was vacant. Right, so it was sort of a bit more understandable then, isn't it? You're not like chasing his, what yeah. he's got. And, but then I got told he'd already accepted it. So ah, right. Like, All right. <laughs> Fucking <laughs> right then. Yeah, Start I've done do loads it. of rounds. We may as well get a title yeah, off him. We may as well get paid for it, eh? Yeah, and I remember thinking like, why has he took it when I've sparred him all the times so he knows what I'm like so like he th- I, yeah and he got in your head a bit like he I was, was thinking, thinking like why would he think that he can beat me off them spars yeah, but yeah. I imagine that's how he was thinking exactly yeah well. 
So what what was the result in the end? Was it a draw? Or no, no contest? he beat me by a point. Did he? Yeah. Oh, right. Well, that was a crack. Of, did you get a point deducted or something? Yeah. That was it. That was something it. Like that that, was, yeah. yeah. I can't remember. I can't but. remember. No, I'd, I'd, I'd like dropped him a couple of times and stuff. It was like well close. And then I think I was on the verge of winning the last round that he got stopped in. That was right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think and I then, remember that. And, and then I think lost he by He stopped point. it early, didn't he? But you were really, you'd have won that. Yeah. You'd have won was, that round. You'd have won the fight. Yeah, I think that was the crack. Yeah. Because he take the, the score at the time, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. See, that was shit. That like, was it in Ireland as well? Is he yeah, Irish? It's in Belfast. Yeah. Yeah. He's Irish as well, isn't he? Yeah, there you go, mate. The atmosphere <laughs> was mental. I bet, mate. It was was that was an MTK show, that. Yeah, it yeah, was, it was. Yeah, I, re- yeah. I remember watching it. That was belting. So we were under like we were under the same man- banner and stuff. Ah, okay. As, as management, but I definitely <laughs> felt like an away fighter there. Like, yeah. What did he make you feel hostile? I mean, yeah, it did a bit. Yeah. Did yeah, that spur you on a bit more? Yeah, I loved it. I yeah. loved, like that just become my thing being the away fighter. I loved it. Well, I suppose we can't really be a home fighter here, innit? Uh, it's like, yeah. you, know, you can't really get that. Probably Preston though, you've boxed in Preston a few times. Yeah, you boxed at the Gold Hall stuff that kind of become like my home. Yeah. That was decent. So looking forward when you made the decision to retire, was it after the Stephen Ward fight? After Hosea Burton fight. I had oh, okay, yes, for that that was that the con- golden contract? Um it was we were both losing semi finalists of the golden right, contract, okay. so they did that. Um, because we obviously we went in the golden contract and lockdown happened. Yes. Okay. Right. And then, and then I had my, I won my quarter. And then the semi, the lockdown happened and we had it behind closed doors, and then we both lost our semi. So we fought each other and that was my last fight. That must have been crazy fighting behind closed doors. Who was that against in the semi final? Against a guy called Sir Michael. Oh right, the he's big a, Latvian or something was he? He's a um, German, yeah, oh, okay. well, Russian. But yeah. lives in Germany or something. He's gone on to be doing quite well, hasn't he? Oh, he did after that. He's done well in bare knuckle boxing. Has he? Strangely, yeah. That's what he's gone to. Yeah. Crazy um, how shit works out, isn't it? Yeah, but yeah, it was a weird one fighting behind closed doors, like because you you could hear everyone's coaches dead clear talking. And stuff. Yeah. And it's corner with like shouting German, <laughs> like getting dead excited and stuff. It was a weird one. It was a good experience. So then after the Hosea Burton fight, you made the decision to retire. Yeah, I'd, I'd kind of made the decision in the build up to the Had fight. You? Yeah, it was a um, it was a British title eliminator again. So I was kind of like, if you get beat, that was you. If you won, you'd have gone on to do it. Just yeah, one but more time. I was kind of like in the build up to the fight. I was kind of thinking like, I'd got to the point where I was like, I hate this. Like, really? Yeah, I just hated traveling to press and stuff and leaving my little lad and yeah, I. I'd been promoted in work and stuff, so I was like, I was getting busy in work, and I was like, I don't need to be doing this. You so know stuff I mean? outside of the gym was changing. Yeah, and I just started becoming like really aware of how bad getting punched in the brain was from yeah, because I was sparring so often and stuff. And so how that's what I wanted to touch on, like, because obviously I've come from a background of like more like sort of K one tie well K1 starts quite hard but Thai MMA we spar quite light to the head because yeah. of the gloves and because of obviously the different aspects of it you're not always on your feet yeah. but boxers spar like hard every sparring session don't they yeah, or most yeah. of them well, you correct me if I'm wrong but yeah I think so yeah is it like did you fi- did you have some rounds in the gym which were like as hard as your fights <laughs> like sometimes you left everything in there 100% like that what I was talking about before when I had like my perfect idea drum, I had a broken nose and stuff all in one chain and camp for that English title fight. Like yeah. I could have arguably arguably pulled out, but Mad. because of what it was I didn't pull out. Yeah. Um like cuts and sparring and stuff like a few times. And I think it's swaying a bit now. I think people are being a bit wise. more clever about it now, yeah. yeah. But um I do think it's where I made the most progress as well. What them hard rounds. Yeah, like sparring 10 rounds three times a week and stuff it's a lot of volume that in it but it's probably it possibly might have shortened my career but like i say, i don't know i think i don't know how good i would have got technically Without if it, it wasn't for that because yeah, i had it, really hard sparring people do say don't they like the only way to get fight ready is to fight yeah <laughs> it's yeah. like you can i know like gyms i've been in you'll spar like hard once a week at least yeah, yeah. In, in a fight camp um, out of camp you don't spar hard at all you're still yeah. going 50 percent. it's not but it's like You've spar hard once in a fight camp, but that's MMA. Like obviously boxing, different because your whole game is punching. And, do you know what I mean? You can't. There's no other way to mix it up. Yeah, yeah. Um, but nothing replicates like even when you're wrestling or you're doing jiu-jitsu full on, going full on like you would in a match. You can't get fit for a match or fit for a fight without replicating that in the yeah, gym. Yeah, just like the fitness is so specific in it. Like, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. 
so like you say running's not gonna do it or anything and you need to know be. when you're getting tired how you're gonna what your techniques like yeah how your breathing's gonna be how you, what your fitness is yeah, like when yeah. someone's trying to take your head clean off yeah and you need to know that yeah you can still stay keep your shape and whatnot when you're yeah really yeah tired when you're stuff. tired not, yeah not revert to bad bad mistakes or making you know what i mean your technique being poor with with your um sparring partners were they sort of brought in throughout your career was that a thing or was it did you travel did they come to you or yeah so basically like in the start of camp we basically used people in the gym and then as ta camp progressed like we'd have a game plan and we'd say right this is what we're gonna do we'll use it on these people first and as the fight got closer the sparring would get a bit harder yeah, a bit yeah. harder a bit harder till i could try and use the game plan on the person preferably yeah someone with a similar style to yeah and you try and bring them in or emulate yeah. someone and emulate them or at you. least if i've got someone tall bring in someone tall or mm. or whatever yeah it's interesting isn't it yeah. with the um with the more that you look back on your career and um obviously you look at like elite fighters now what do you think it takes to be like elite world level so the things that you learn what do you think Elite in boxing as well, but like traits that are similar to applicable over sports. What do you think do you look at in pro boxers, for example, as elite and what makes them elite? It's a hard question, but... Yeah, that's a tricky one. Some like world level um, people that I was around, but it was like the, the mindset of them that that made them stand out i yeah. think more than like anything physical is that like what yeah you, yeah you exactly yeah, like, yeah like, they're always like kind of stoic in what they did uh, dialed in yeah and I, I remember sparring martin murray once and his um his opponent had been changed and he's obviously like one of the well probably the best person i ever sparred like world level yeah and his opponent had changed and i remember thinking like that I'd probably throw you off a bit. I think he was getting like a southpaw instead yeah. of that. And I was like, that's a fucking, that'd burn your head out a bit. That. And he was just kind of like shugging it off. Like, Didn't yeah, like phase like, him. And I was just like, yeah, that's probably like the difference in it. Like, just yeah, like, the attitude to it. Yeah, just like, just, it's just the job. You just got to yeah. crack on and do it. There's the, that approach to training as well, like something hard and you've just got to do it. It's just a job. Like yeah, that. zoning out and not treating it as yeah. like they want all the luxuries. It's just, this is what I'm doing. I've got to do it this way. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy because like you say, most, most people in any, probably like any champion, any elite athlete will be like that. They'll just be like, it's that dialed in, nothing phases them. Yeah. They yeah. know the job, they show up and do it. Because there'll obviously be people that are more talented than people that have, and then world champions that have probably never made it but there's yeah, a reason yeah. you've got to have everything haven't you yeah. you've got to be talented you've got to have the mindset is 100 percent the main one and then obviously you've got to set your life up around that yeah, to yeah. funnel in of uh, being being the best i remember the last couple of years of my career i was like that dialed in when i won i was just like all right that's that's my job's done now i've won that Whereas early in my career, I'd like to celebrate the wins a bit more. Yeah, yeah. I was just like that focused on getting to a British title. I was like, right, that's another one. one. That's just like one step the box. Like, like, I just go to bed or whatever. I won't go and like, go and have a drink with my mates or yeah, anything. And it was stuff. just back and, like, to business. And like, I imagine that's probably a lot of what, it, like the people that have gone well further than me. Are yeah. Like, it's, it, it was just like, I won that golden contract. And it was like a massive thing. I won that quarterfinal should I say and I remember just like having a Pepsi and going to bed and just being like right it's a quarterfinal done yeah there's, ne there's, a, there's goals training. after yeah. this you've got to stay on track for but I look back at it and I think like and I've retired I think like maybe I should have like celebrated the wins more a bit, a bit more. you know what I mean enjoyed yeah. it a bit more rather than putting so much pressure on it but yeah but at the end of the day like you say, it's your goals and in it you try to get to your goals so it's yeah. hard to say like you don't want to celebrate every well I don't know it's hard isn't it it's a tricky yeah. one it because you don't know if you're if you were like that, if you were like celebrating every little like success you had it and you weren't as dialed into it, would you would you have would I have like done as well? As well, yeah, it's a tricky one. But. It is, isn't it, yeah. With the um obviously we touched on that, with being around sort of like elite athletes, people in your life, who do you think was or has been the biggest sort of influence to your career? Sporting career or sporting life since I don't know since you could be anyone. Who do you think's played the biggest part? Johnny and Preston. Johnny yeah. Roy, yeah. 
Yeah, hundred percent. From a technical standpoint, or just being just be the person that he is. Just, just the person. Yeah, just like I think he had a lot of. I think like how I ended up as a person was a lot thanks to Johnny because I I met him at like twenty or whatever nineteen twenty. Like I say, it was like my mum was poorly and stuff at the time. It was quite, it's quite like a big part of your life in your yeah, early yeah. 20s, isn't it? Like I guess yeah. between 20 and 30, you change a lot. Don't Very you? impressionable, aren't you? Yeah, and I, and I think he, he he had like a big impact on me kind of thing and in boxing and outside of it. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can probably learn a lot from people that, um, like say, he was probably a good, really good coach technically. But I feel like the most I've ever learned from people, coaches, they were really good technically, but they've not just they've been good people yeah do you know what yeah. i mean you can get the message across they're not just bothered about you winning yeah. they're more bothered about you developing as a person as well yeah, and then yeah. just being a much better coach do you know what i mean they do the whole package yeah, yeah i'd rather be coached by someone like that myself even if they're a bit less technically knowledgeable than someone who's just hell-bent on you being the best technically but they can't really manage you as a person they don't know how you tick yeah i, yeah. I think that's what that was going to be my next question is like what do you think makes a good coach in anything, whether it's boxing, tri- and conditioning, anything? But it's probably the same thing in it being like yeah, and just like being passionate about it. Yeah, isn't it? like like there'd be not worse and than having a coach that didn't have the same passion for it as what you should yeah. have, kind of thing. Yeah, who drives you to want it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like with I think as well with me and Johnny, like his it felt like his whole goal was to be a British champion, which was mine. It felt like we were just like proper on the same mission. Like yeah. it, he will have had little other goals. He had other yeah. trainers, to, he had other fighters to train, but it felt like his old goal was just for me to be a British champion. It was like where, where like it felt like it wasn't just me. It felt like it was just me and him on this like mission. A team. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It was like, and it's quite well cool looking back. Yeah. Cool. Like, that's yeah. belted. It was like, it didn't feel like it was just a like box on a mission. It was like, oh, this is our little like yeah, tag that, team. That's quality. Bit of kind of thing. So I think probably to have a genuine relationship with the people that you're training. And, and know stuff. that they care about you. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah, it's hard. It must be hard, especially when you've got different fighters to be able to put that much into each one. Yeah, but like yeah. you say, like you felt it was just like you two on that mission, but you probably had other fighters he was he yeah, was training as well. But like he trains his kid and stuff like crazy. that. Like, and his kid used to come to my weigh-ins and stuff like that. That's built in, isn't it? Yeah, but like obviously he's got goals with him and stuff. But like whenever, whenever it was like my time to train and stuff, that was he was just fully was dialed in. Me. And yeah, and that's how it felt. <clears throat> that's the way it should be, isn't it? Yeah, so I guess it, I guess for the coach, it's just to make someone feel like you're all on the same mission kind of yeah. thing. I guess that would go a long way. It's probably not the kind of thing you're asking. No, no, but it's good because it shows that, like, I'm trying to work out, obviously I'm trying to coach people at the minute, and I was sort of, like, fell into the coaching role as a, as a thing, and I'm picking stuff up from people. I'm not the technical side. It's more so what I'm interested in is how people can get the message across, what you try to show them. There's, there's, you can watch videos and everything on the internet yeah. but the thing that I'm interested in is what makes a good relationship between a coach and a fighter or a coach and an athlete yeah. and I think it is having that personal level showing that you care but and not everyone's the same so knowing how that coach can be relatable to that athlete but he might treat this athlete or fighter totally different yeah, because yeah. he knows that he needs an arm around him he needs fucking shouting at yeah, not yeah. shouting at but he needs do you know what I mean and I'm interested in that side of it the sort of psychology behind it rather than the the technical nuance, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So for like, for like, fighting in the change room, some people like to get like really like worked up and yeah. like banging things around and stuff. And I thought I needed that when I was young. And then like the better me and Johnny got to know each other, like the last few fights in my career, we'd just like we'd have a bit of a warm up. We'd keep the mood dead light with a bit of Bob Marley on or something. We'd just have a crack and we were just like dead. The atmosphere was like dead sterile and that. Yeah. And that like was just like because he, like, he, he knew what I needed. I needed to be like chilled out to think clearly and stuff. And was that get... conversations that you had that he knew that or did he just learn that? As I think, he, I think he just you? learned that through training with me. And then I, like obviously I'd be like, as I got a bit older and a bit more confident, I'd, I'd be like, I like to keep it dead light and stuff in a change room like to have my mates in there having a yeah yeah and stuff not and so that. serious and like ramped yeah, up and yeah yeah like so yeah that that kind of <clears> thing like but that's just from getting to know your people you're training i guess for you, you to probably take. spend a lot of time with him as well aren't you yeah 
He's um, like you still keeping in touch now. Yeah, yeah. I'm oh, good. Um, caught a see him next month. Yeah. In terms of, we're going to touch on your next sporting endeavours in a minute, but in terms of boxing, is there any bits like because you probably don't train much? Well, you train a lot, but I mean the boxing side of it. Is there parts of it you miss? Do you know what I mean? Like the actual in pads or. I love the pads and I love sparring. Everyone loves it in pads, don't yeah, they? It's yeah. great. Yeah, if you've got a good pad person yeah. as well, that can make you feel a bit decent. Like, I love that. <laughs> um, like, my mate, he used to do a lot of pads when he was good, at, good on the pads and stuff. Moved away to uni, he done pads with Tom, me. Tom, yeah, well, really yeah. good, yeah. But um, whenever I get a sense that it's coming back to bar, I'm like, do you fancy a bit of pads? <laughs> but there's not many other people I do pads yeah, with. That is right. I, I remember someone told me, I think it was Ross, I'd seen Ross and Jim and he said, oh, Tom might be coming back to Barra and I texted him and was like, mate, if you come back to Barra, yeah. please let me know. Get yeah. some pads in. Yeah, he's really good, Tom, and he? Really yeah, good. Yeah. So yeah, pads and sparring. Yeah. Fair, and then the rest of it, like, you just make yourself enjoy, don't you? Yeah, like, the, the monotonous, tedious stuff. Yeah, if, like, I don't know if I'd have ever stopped if the gym wanted in Preston. Yeah. And, like, I might have retired, but I probably would have just kept if the helping. gym was still here yeah yeah, yeah. I probably kept helping helping them out with sparring and stuff but like i said i did start becoming quite aware of how often i'd been punched since i was like nine so well, that's it in it yeah to travel when it's not you haven't got fights coming up it's a big ask in it yeah, when yeah. you've got kids and people at home that rely on you again it's a shame that they're in the well there is there's amateur boxing clubs around here obviously but um like we have that pro level sort of sparring that you don't really can't really get. Yeah, Cause yeah. Because it's probably you sparring amateurs. Is even still you're retired. It's not going to be what you all want to get the juices flowing, is it? Yeah, Do you know what I mean? Maybe, maybe I won't start in case I ever get leveled. Up <laughs> <and> so, <yeah. laughs> who knows, mate? Who knows? Yeah. We'll do some. But I asked you to do some sparring though. So, so mate. Obviously, touching on from retirement and boxing's finished. Um, now you've took up jujitsu. Um, obviously, something I've been doing for a while. But I'll be found transitioning from. A sport like boxing, I know you've always kept fit doing other stuff, to now a totally different martial arts slash combat sport. And um, if anything, has boxing helped you get better at this? Has it helped you train for it and so on? Um, the transition to it was mad at first because because I'd boxed and then we signed up for that for that intro car. So I was like, I know I can fight, so I'll be all right. Yeah, and yeah. Then, and then like some of the smallest people in there just absolutely ragged me around and I was like <laughs> I need to learn how to do this properly yeah. kind of thing but in terms of like traits that have helped me from boxing is like I understand just like drilling boring shit to get better at it like I don't get bored of it because I'm like this is going to benefit me yeah, and yeah. I kind of like like drilling stuff and seeing you get better at it and like start pulling it off like I like that that's what I liked in boxing too so <laughs> yeah that's helped and also i've obviously spent like 20 years getting my head punched in so i'm used to getting beat up in spars yeah. and stuff like that so that helps but something i suppose with jiu-jitsu is you can go full on now and not get punched in you can spar 100 yeah, percent. yeah. Get, you're not getting headaches at the end of it yeah yeah it's, so it's, you can it's got a lot of longevity in it and you can do it for a long time yeah i can picture myself like doing it for ages yeah. like even if i just do it like, a couple times a week and just picture myself sticking in there like even like as an old guy you can kind of, i feel like when you're good you can kind of like change your style to yeah to suit, suit as like, you get older yeah, yeah and obviously yeah you go with people your similar age or when people go with you if you were older say 50 60 you know that if you're going with people you trust you know that you're not going to work you because do you know what i mean if you are older yeah, so yeah. i've noticed a lot yeah. Me and Mike spoke about it, like, obviously I've noticed it from, I've been doing bits for you though, but about how coachable, like, you are. Yeah, yeah. Like, from, that's what he said as well, and I've noticed it, is like how much you retain the information, like, you can show you something at once and you do it. Yeah. And that's obviously from years and years of just, and the good thing about it is that I found with you is that you don't, there's no ego with you at all. Yeah, yeah. Even when you first started, like, some people might think, fucking hell, I'm a pro boxer, I've, I can really handle myself, if any of them, but, you just totally went in that whole beginner mind frame and just like sucked it up. Like it must be cut. Well, obviously it isn't hard for you, but for some people they probably struggle with that because they're going from like being top of the pile yeah, yeah. straight back to the bot, not the bottom, but the beginner yeah, yeah. where they're going to get beat up because you're doing jujitsu. It's like, it's so fresh, but you're that guy that there's like, if you got tapped, what, how'd you do that? I want to learn how to do that. It's not like, fuck's sake, I'm going home, kicking myself now because I got yeah. tapped by someone who's younger or, lighter or whatever. Do I you think know what I, mean? I quite like 
I like I like I'm enjoying being new and there being like loads of information to take. Yeah, and it being like fresh being to a selfish, like everyone like like the blue belts and that can give me information, it's like massive to me. Yeah. Whereas it was like the other way around in boxing, it's like until we were getting sparring in close to me fighting stuff, a lot of the times I was like sparring people, like talking free stuff, helping them kind of thing. It was like Yeah, yeah while you're I was giving all the time. Whereas now it's like pretty much anyone can <laughs> give me advice Rolls because I'm reversed, brand new. Yeah. I, en- I enjoy it and I enjoy trying to get good at things yeah so. yeah that's that's a lot and obviously from all your career you'll learn you will get good at it 100% like like yeah. you say it's reps but you already understand you know what you know what it takes to get good at something yeah you know you've got to put hours in you know to do the rep it's the same stuff it's just a different sport yeah it's um, like what I was saying I have a crack on a lot about like you just turn up and like just keep practicing it's a secret you can get good at whatever you want you mate, can 100% that's what Absolutely. I mean. It's just it's just hours. But do you find it? Well, I know you what you to say, but do you find it humbling the sport of jiu-jitsu, like the sport jujitsu or the martial art? Do you find it quite humbling? Yeah, it's one of them that keeps knocking you down, and like every time you start thinking you forget it for a yeah. like, like I've been like trying to compete a fair bit, and then like without sounding like a bit of a knob, I was like thinking I'm alright for a white belt, and then. I started thinking I can beat these blue belts in this absolutely yeah. I was like, I think I'm alright yeah. for a white belt kind of thing and then the blue belt just fucking done me in like a minute and I was like, Alright, yeah, put me back <laughs> in the I'm fucking shit, I'm all <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's like you will, it's the you same will, in the gym as well. You will get quick. You will get good quick though. Like, because you're training a lot. Yeah. You want it to learn. I feel like what stagnates people when they first started, I was the world's worst. It took me about seven months to actually relax. Yeah. Like, and just be like stop thinking I was strong because I wasn't. I used to gas out after like, I'd get, you told someone there and like, then it took me six or seven months to drop my ego really. Yeah, yeah. And actually like think like, fucking hell, like I'm getting submitted, not seeing my ass. Now like, how am I actually going to learn to progress? So it stops happening. Then I start asking questions. Yeah. I'd start breaking stuff down and then I've sort of used that now in the other stuff I'm doing and knowing not to have an ego. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Because yeah, yeah, it's yeah. probably the first thing I did that was really hard jujitsu. But and then I got once I dropped that, I got good at certain aspects of it pretty quick, yeah, and it helped yeah. me within like MMA, for example. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you you probably didn't have that coming in. I don't think any lot from the beginners course did. Maybe that's why the beginners course and props to Mike for doing it yeah. helped because I didn't see any who's like coming. You know, some people really struggle to like chill out and let people do anything yeah but it was like there was no egos and maybe that's props uh, to mike for doing it do you every, know what i mean every now and then i have to like check in with myself like i've start you start thinking about winning roles and that and yeah then, and then like it'll be like every couple of weeks and i'm like ah if you just like enjoy it and like try stuff you'll get better even if you just kind of like not prepared to lose, but just like yeah, you can't be asked about winning the role. Yeah, yeah, you? exactly. In the, in, the, in the gym, like no one's asked. No, that is, so you may as well. But try sometimes you, you get that scared to lose. You yeah. don't try and win, and, and being scared to thing. lose, you just do the same thing, and you're gonna get beat anyway. Yeah, yeah. you got to take risks, aren't you? Yeah, and you know yeah, that as long as you're training in a decent gym with decent people, no one's gonna work. No one's gonna be a dick and hurt you. So the, if they are trying stuff and you get put in bad positions, they're not gonna crank stuff on, and yeah. you're in a safe space, really. I've got one for you. What's the crack with people saying that, like, when they get to blue belt, they start coming and that? I don't get it. It's like a blue belt curse, I think. Why, though? I don't know. I feel like with it, it's just a case of you're getting stagnant and you realise that the hill is massive to climb and it's still a big journey, especially in the belts, because you've got to go from blue belt to purple belt, purple to brown and brown to black. Yeah. And then most people, black belt to tell you, obviously I'm not one, but when they get to black belt... And they roll with other black belts. You realise, fuck, my actual jujitsu journey's literally just started. Yeah, there's levels to black. Oh, well. huge my levels, man. mate, and it's it's crazy in itself. But I don't feel like a belt is always representative of your skill level either. Yeah, because I know blue belts on the world scene, blue belts in England that would absolutely murder most black belts. Yeah. Obviously, age is relative to that. So, if an 18 year old blue belt who's competing at like the world at blue belt. They're probably black belts, black belt skill level if they're winning it. Yeah, or yeah. even sometimes winning the Euros at blue belt. They're probably black belt level. They can't be a black belt because of their age, because of the training age. Right, right, yeah. There's, there's rules of how long you have to hold each belt to be a black belt in, in the eyes of the IBJJF. Yeah, yeah. Which is why like some people like Nicky Ryan and Nicky Rod don't compete in IBJJF comps because they haven't held each belt long enough. Oh, really? Yeah. 
<laughs> like big Dan, I think is it Dan Wilson who trains, I think he trains with Next Wave, Jock Gordon, right? He's only a purple belt, but he's not, he's not a purple belt level, he's a black belt level. He posted a really good video the other day, actually, that the belt should be representative of your own journey, not anyone else's. Yeah, so yeah. he's been training jiu-jitsu for f however long, but he says he's, he's a blue belt in terms of his own progression because he's going to get so much better because he might have only been training for five years. Yeah, he's yeah. beating black belts, but he is a purple belt or blue belt in terms of his own yeah, career. Yeah, like specific to him. Specific to him, which I think, when I read the video, I was like, that's the best, watch the video, sorry, that's the best take I've ever heard on it. Yeah, yeah. Because it's true, it's like most some, some high level blue belts would absolutely murder most black belts. And it's like American blue belts at winning worlds or whatever would murder most UK black belts. Not UK, but yeah. average black belts yeah, that yeah. are in America as well. Because they might train three times a day. Yeah, they yeah. might be 18 full of beans, you know what I mean? And it's like, if you start at like, if you start when you're older or whatever, you can't really come, you can't really say, well, if he gets to a blue belt when they're in the fifties or whatever, and then exactly. a white belt might beat him because they're like eighteen yeah, or, exactly. sauce or something, you're like you can't really come. That's it, why it's it. all relative to in the eyes of your coach and your own sort of journey. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, it's good that they have the belt because it's sort of. But again, it should just be a a, a, a metric of your own success yeah, yeah, and so your own journey. Yeah, of like the graft you've put in on. Yeah, that. rather than measuring it against someone else. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Because you, you meet, cool. might meet some black belts who's been training 12, 13 years. He might be 40, works a full-time job, 40, 50. And you might catch him and people are like, wow, I've just tapped a black belt. But we'll rel make it relative to what you do. You might be training twice a day. Yeah, yeah. He's training three times a week, but he's been doing it 15 years. He's probably technically very good in certain aspects, but he might not be as fit, he might not be as quick, he might not be as athletic. Yeah, yeah. That's where I feel like it all gets lost. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And then people see that seeing getting a blue belt they think they've clicked it all and they stop because they realise it, oh, it might feel so far away yeah, but yeah, yeah I don't know why it's like Mike always brings it up about the blue belt curse but mm. it's my day it's like a legit thing like to it me now because I'm not a blue belt lover, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like why would you stop you just you, you just enjoyed it as a white belt yeah. you would still enjoy it as a blue belt you'd think but it's weird how it, it is weird how it works but I know a few people in even in Barrow that have done it Yeah, me being one of them I stopped training <laughs> in the gi when I got to a blue belt but Always stayed training Nogi, um, but again, that's that's not for really MMA, not yeah not for that. MMA. So it's relative. But touching on um, MMA, would you ever reckon you'd have like not an MMA fight? Would you ever reckon you'd like to do the training for it? I would like to train for it. Yeah. I wouldn't like to do the fight though. Yeah. I'm too old for the fight. Man. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot in it. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. It's like it's like even jujitsu. Like weirdly, like in terms of like little niggles on my knees and stuff. You Never had that in boxing in 20 <laughs> years. I got the little niggles on my knees and elbows and so the time. Now I imagine it's worse. With, I mean, as I say, I've had a lot of punches to the brain in my time, yeah. so I don't think... Different, it. innit? But I'd, 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 I watch like the UFC now with a different appreciation. I used to watch it and think, like, he should know how to keep this on the feet. Why is he not keeping it on the feet? And I'll watch it and I see people like controlling each other with grappling and I'll buzz off it. And I'll, like, I'd like to get an appreciation for that. I yeah, like there's train a, it. you realise what's going on. You yeah, know, yeah. like the specifics behind it and how technical it is. Yeah, and I think I enjoy that more now when I watch yeah, it than, yeah, the, yeah. than the striking side of it. Yeah, because I feel like to do that to someone, control them, submit them. Don't like, I'm not saying it takes more skill by any chance of knocking someone out, but knocking someone out, you've got that sort of lucky punch sort yeah, of chance, just, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like catch someone like with good timing once. Whereas like, yeah, like you say, when you're grappling with someone, well, you're proving you're a better person all the time. Exactly, yeah. yeah you're constantly working. So, competition-wise, you're going to be getting some more jiu-jitsu competitions in. Yeah. I mean, I'll be keeping an eye out. Hopefully, I'll be out with you next year as well, doing some myself. Yeah, yeah. But I'll see how my uh, training goes. But I've really enjoyed that crack, mate. Thanks for coming on. Hopefully, nice we one. do it uh, another time in the future. But nice one. I really appreciate it. No worries. Cheers, nice lad. Nice one. one.